I know that there was one thing where I said, let's stand up over there. And we were going up there. We'd like to get the most I can do. Up to where there is. Up to where there is. <laughs> Good evening again, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Carpenka, and I am the event coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. Tonight's event is coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis nations. Special hello to anyone joining us through the live stream from home. And for those of you who are here in person, thank you so much for joining us as well. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Saskatoon launch of Tracking the Caribou Queen by Margaret McPherson. Thank you to Margaret for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank U.S. Press and especially Carolina Ortiz for working with us to create this event. We have a very special guest host this evening, uh, David Carpenter. David is the author of 14 books, including The Gold and Welcome to Canada. He has received several Saskatchewan book awards, including the Book of the Year for his memoir, Under's Confession. He is the winner of the Kloppenberg Literary Award, and in 2018, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Saskatchewan. He has hiked, fished, canoed, and camped all of his life, and he joins us tonight for a special conversation with Margaret McPherson. Raised in Yellowknife, now Denende, Northwest Territories, Margaret has an English literature degree from the University of New Brunswick and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from UBC. She has published a few nonfiction books, including a biography of Firebrand Nellie McClung titled Voice for the Voiceless in the early 2000s, but it was the publication of her short story collection, Perilous Departures, that launched her literary career. Her first novel released was nominate, nominated for a Manitoba Best Book Award in 2009, followed by a second novel, Body Trade, which won the De Beers Northwards Prize for Outstanding Book in 2012. Margaret paints, travels, laughs long and often, and continues to explore and record the mystical communion of living things. She has recently moved to Deep River in North, Northern Ontario to begin her third act with her life partner. We will now hear from David, followed by Margaret, and then a discussion followed by a brief Q&A. Please give David a warm welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for coming in. And thank you, Margaret, for giving me a second kick at the can here. <laughs> I wouldn't be here except for Margaret and her wonderful book. Um, I'm going to read uh, one uh, about eight minute, ten minute chapter from my book. Uh, I never met a rattlesnake I didn't like. Um, <laughs> it's 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 all about predaceous creatures in in wilderness areas like grizzlies and cougars and wolves and and, and rattlesnakes and and uh and my extreme love for all of these scary creatures that occasionally scare me this is this chapter is entitled chug a rum chug a rum Would this be a little bit better? Yes. Oh, oh good. This is oh, this is a microphone. <laughs> I better just get it a little higher. I'm I'm gonna do the wrong thing no matter what I do. Okay. I might too. <laughs> Sorry. That's that's great. And is this good distance right here? Okay, thank you. Um, chug a rum, chug a rum. So here we were once again, Kiever and I in our little Corolla, this time driving south on the Natchez Trace, heading from Mississippi to Louisiana. I was wondering what a really big alligator would look like and how it might sound if disturbed. In our previous visits to the Deep South, we had come up with meager results in our quest for finding big gators of the 12-foot variety. I had read stories about them, but I wanted to see the real thing. I imagine that the paleontologists and taxonomists who have attempted to trace the evolution of the American alligator are sometimes perplexed by the many species of dinosaurs 
that resembled alligators and the two ancestors of alligators that looked more like dinosaurs. This quandary needed millions of years to get sorted out. Apparently in the Jurassic period, that's about 200 million years ago, dinosaurs began to take their, their own dinosaurian path away from their alligator kin. And they went on to dominate their terrestrial habitats. In the same period, alligators began gradually to look like alligators, stubby limbs spread apart and flattened as opposed to the locked in legs of dinosaurs, long bodies and tails, flat and toothy snouts and strong jaws good for snatching their victims from off the shore. Some of these alligator ancestors reached a length of 40 feet and a weight of 10 tons. Crocodiles and alligators perhaps sensibly retreated from the predations of the big dinosaurs to various marine habitats. When the great meteor struck at the beginning of the Cretaceous period, now, now about 65 years ago, the terrestrial dinosaurs disappeared while the crocs and the gators survived. Only the supersized members of their species were lost. Perhaps the most remarkable part of their story is that from the late Cretaceous period onwards, the surviving crocodiles and alligators did very well and changed very little. By the turn of our millennium, when Kiwa and I began our road trips to the deep south, we had never seen an alligator in the wild. We had done some hiking in East Texas, the western edge of their habitat, and in North Carolina at the northern extreme of alligator habitat, and had ne never encountered one. But when we journeyed, journeyed farther south into the heart of alligator territory, we began to see them in impressive numbers. They thrived in the brackish waters of southwestern Louisiana, in the estuaries of the intercoastal waterway, small ones up to three or four feet long. But here we were, Kiever and I, driving south on the Natchez Trace, about to leave Mississippi and revisit Louisiana. During a Faulkner pilgrimage to Oxford, Mississippi, and an Elvis pilgrimage to Tupelo, just an hour's drive from Oxford, we came upon the Natchez Trace, a gorgeous little highway for slow drivers and nature vultures like ourselves. We saw plenty of wild turkeys, lots of deer and squirrels, but still at this point, nary a gator. Another critter that I had somehow missed out on throughout my life was the legendary American bullfrog. Um, until a few days ago, I thought I had never seen one and then somebody told me otherwise. Um, anyway, I, I had read about bullfrogs, heard stories about their voracious appetites, and even read recipes extolling their meaty thighs. I was told that in Ontario, their mating calls could invade the sleep cottage dwellers from blocks away, chug a rum, chug a rum, and all that. Bullfrogs have probably commanded more attention from alligators than from paleontologists and taxonomists, but their evolution is just as interesting. Their presence on this planet appears to be much longer than that of gators or crocs. The frog's predecessors come from way back in the Devonian period, 370 million years ago. The bullfrog is the largest frog on our continent and with a reputation throughout the planet for eating almost anything that moves, including scorpions, tarantulas, and venomous snakes. snakes. That is snakes too small to make a meal of bullfrogs. So here we were in April, 2008, navigating the Natchez Trace heading for Louisiana. We arrived uh, late one day at St. Francisville, a lovely old town not far from the Mississippi River and just a handful of miles into Louisiana from Mississippi. We spotted the St. Francisville Inn on the main drag and we pulled over. The inn is an old mansion, nicely shaded by big trees and crowned with tresses of Spanish moss. The Wolf Schlesinger House, as local, local historians call it, had been a general store built between 1878 and 1881 by Morris Wolf, a Jewish merchant who had emigrated to Louisiana in the mid 19th century. His story is a different story, a very interesting one. During registration, we fell into a leisurely conversation with the proprietor, Patrick Walsh, 
where to eat in town, where to see the historic sites, and especially where to go and gawk at bullfrogs and alligators. Walsh smiled. Well, now there's a question I don't get very often. He told us about a pond just beyond the other side of town that harbored bullfrogs and a pair of alligators, among other critters. He's got a big old male that has a taste for chickens, he said. Chickens? Yeah, Walsh said, shaking his head. Teenagers like to drive by and throw frozen chickens into the pond. He never explained to us how an alligator might nosh on a frozen chicken. Would the teenagers tear off the plastic wrappings first? <laughs> Would the alligator wait until the chicken had thawed? You folks be careful now, he said. Watch out for snakes. Don't go and get yourself bit. We found the pond next to a dirt road just beyond the edge of town. We left the road and descended through trees along what looked like a game trail. We were scanning it for snakes when I heard a loud croaking sound. I wondered if I hadn't heard this sound before somewhere when I wasn't looking for bullfrogs. Strange that a bullfrog should greet us with his croak the very day, the very hour we were looking for one. It croaked again and true to its reputation, it was very loud. Probably not the fabled chug rum sound, but every bit as loud as reported. We descended, quiet and tremulous, listening for a big frog and looking out for an alligator. We saw neither, but again, we heard that mighty croak. They say if you stand still as a tree and just look, you'll see things. Kiever and I waited still as trees for the big reveal. Along came an alligator gliding slowly down the middle of the pond. It was about six feet long, probably the resident female gator we had been told about or which, uh, which for us was pretty impressive. Perhaps she was looking for a nice bullfrog for lunch, or at least chicken. <laughs> While we were waiting to see if the alligator would find its dinner, I started to think how in their own world, scorpions and tarantulas were scary looking predators to be avoided. And the big bullfrogs in the jungles all around the equator lapped them up like chicken wings. Eight to 10 inch bullfrogs are the Tyrannosaurus rexes of their neighborhood. In Louisiana, an eastern diamondback rattlesnake or even a water moccasin might swallow a bullfrog whole, and a gator the size of the one swimming away from us might easily devour the snake. I wondered about the super gators of the Jurassic period, how poorly they might fare in a tussle with a tyrannosaurus. How strange this ancient cafeteria called nature. We moved on, and I heard the croak again, but from much closer. It was not really a croak, much less a chug a rum, but loud enough to send out vibrations in the air and tiny ripples on the water. It brought us both to attention. We crept forward near the edge of the pond, but not too close, knowing at last this was no bullfrog. And there he was, lying in the shade across the pond, all 12 feet of him, dark green with ridges running like ancient mountain ranges down the full length of his hide. A survivor from a line that led back before all sapiens, all hominids, all mammals, to the steaming swamps of the Cretaceous period, an ancient brute lying in the shade and giving voice to his ancient appetite. The alligator was going nowhere, but he seemed to know that we were the ones who had broken in on his slumber. Perhaps he was simply bellowing at us to back off. Somewhere between fear and reluctance, we backed away from the pond and we lost sight of the great reptile. Chickens, I wondered. A steady diet of frozen chickens? Probably anything of any size that trades straight too near. A whitetail, a possum, a wild piglet, a bullfrog, or a Canadian simply looking for his first bullfrog. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dave. Um, I only saw an alligator once. It was in uh, New Orleans in the Everglades. And I was with my friend who I was traveling with. 
and we were with about seven very hungover frat boys. <laughs> and it was, uh, we went on a kind of hovercraft and it was really, really cool to see, but the frat boys were polluting the Everglades. <laughs> and it was a little distressing to be with these, uh, these people, but thank you for that reading. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. This is my first, um, this is my first launch uh, in Western Canada of this book that I worked on for 12 years. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful um, to McNally Robinson, to my publishers, to every person that's in this room for coming out. And I'm particularly grateful to Dave because we wanted somebody who was local from Saskatoon so that like, um, I could present with somebody who is local, but I, I want to uh, share a little bit about Tracking the Caribou Queen. Um, and I thought I would just start, I'm going to read two bits of it. The first bit is actually my author's note explaining to you why I, I chose to write this memoir. And then I'll show you a little bit of a sample of some of the vignettes inside uh, the, the vignettes that I recorded in this book. Um, and I'm just going to read because I think if I start talking, I might get like um, off track. <laughs> so um, my name is Margaret McPherson. And I'm particularly grateful to my brother, Rod, and my sister-in-law, Jean, because I think most of you are friends with bears, but I'm really happy, to, really, really happy to be here. And I'll read just this first bit is short. And it's my author's note, why I wrote this memoir. Tracking the Caribou Queen has been more than a decade in the making. Begun as a personal reconciliation project to more honestly understand the role race and privilege played in my foundational thinking. The work predictably morphed into a multi-layered examination of my past, my psyche, and the insidious way Systemic racism shaped my youth in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories during the 60s and 70s. Tracking the Caribou Queen was painful to write. The language in the text, offensive now, is the language of the times. For some, the material present, presented may trigger painful and unprocessed memories. It is not my intention to hurt or re-traumatize any community of readers, but rather to reveal how my own thinking about indigeneity in those days was warped by stereotype, prejudice, and white privilege. Uncomfortable as it was to face my own part in Canada's colonization of indigenous peoples, I believed that my way forward lay in telling my own experience as truthfully as I could. All of the events in this book are recounted in varying degrees of acuity and precision. In some instances, I have shaped chronology, geography, and identity to serve the story. I have changed names, melded the lives of one or two or more people into one character, and altered gender, age, and even ethnicity to protect innocent people. My early life was intertwined with others many of whom may be profoundly uncomfortable having their lives projected on these pages through the lens of a child and later a teenager sorting out her own issues of personal culpability. It is these people I wish to protect. The book's adolescent love story is shaped by the intense longing of a lonely teenage girl. As such, I believe it is at its heart true. <laughs> Public figures, including my much beloved father, who spent the majority of his educational career in the Northwest Territories, have remained relatively unaltered. The attitudes of these men and some women were shaped by a different time and sensibility. My intention is neither to shame nor humiliate them, but rather to illuminate the systemic racism inherent in the settler experience and illustrate the trickle down effect on subsequent generations based on entrenched ideas, paternalism, 
misogyny, and patriarchy. I am by no means an expert on Northern colonization, assimila assimilation policy, or federal educational initiatives. Indeed, I would encourage white readers to further their own understanding of the impact of colonization by reading accounts from an indigenous perspective. And there are many here in this bookstore I was so happy to see. This writing is drawn from my lived individual experience. I feel compelled to own my whiteness. Not good, not bad, simply a fact. As much as I acknowledge and hold myself accountable for the missteps and mistakes that came from my generation and the generation before me. My hope is that readers, be they Indigenous or settler, recognize aspects of their own life in this work. Colonizing people cannot begin to enable justice until we understand our place and agency in past injustices. In naming our participation, in owning the actions of the past, we can begin to take responsibility for our part in it. Only then can we make way for a right and equitable future as true treaty people. So that's why I wanted to explain um, why I wrote this book and why it took me so long. Now, <clears throat> the language in the book is not like that. It's a series of vignettes all based on um, my growing up years. And because you know and love Rod, I thought I would start with him. I don't call him Rod though. I call him Paul, but he's Rod. <laughs> and um, I wanna read this section because it sort of exemplifies uh, the situation of my parents coming up in 1961, um, five little towhead kids, and them living in Yellowknife before um, there was a lot, it was a very small community at that time. And there was no real, I mean, there was government, but it was all governed by the federal government. And we were uh, quite a young family. So I'll just go ahead. We had been in Yellowknife for almost six years when Paul went out with some other 14 year old boys and came home boasting of killing a ptarmigan on Tin Can Hill. It was just standing there like a dupe. We were in the kitchen of the house by the school. The kettle had just boiled and the air was thick and steamy. So everything in the warm room appeared malleable and soft around the edges. Paul, however, stood ramrod straight and shouldered his imaginary rifle. As he looked down its barrel through the sights, his cheeks puffed and collapsed. A muted explosion issuing from his mouth. There was blood, lots of it. He looked to my mother, who was pressing one of my father's shirts on the kitchen counter, a white towel beneath her task. Or, or at least it looked like there was lots, he faltered, uh, be, because of the snow. We were all listening, but it was 11-year-old Will who was in awe. His eyes sparkled, killing something, hunting. It was what Yellowknife boys did. And now Paul, slight pale Paul, had killed a bird. It was radical, cool, almost as though Will had done it himself. How much blood, Paul? Were there feathers and guts? Did you blow it to bits, Paul? Did you? Did you? But before my oldest brother could answer, a strangled sound came from my mother's throat. It wasn't loud, but it stopped all, all the sounds in that blurry close kitchen. It was an agony we had not heard before. Ned looked scared. I was shocked. Paul was immediately silenced. Only Jennifer spoke, Mom? Mom? The sound continued, a deep guttural gasp. It was not the iron hitting the countertop, nor the rasp of the cord across the canister set. It was my mother, my mother, imitating something in the throes of death. Her face was like my father's shirt. What did that bird do to you, Paul? The iron hung midair, hissing in space. 
And before anyone could answer, she slowly and deliberately placed the hot iron down on the shirt. What did it do to you? She asked again, Put, putting both hands on her hips. What did that bird do to make you want to kill? We looked at Paul squirming. The hot weighted iron began to scorch the cloth. Dad's good work shirt. We could smell the burn, but our mother did not move. She waited. Nothing. Tears were heavy in that single word, and I prayed for them to come, to stay the iron, to cool the scorch, but there was no release. Say it. Smoke or steam or a mixture of both was rising from the dress shirt. My mother ignored everything but her eldest child. It did nothing. It didn't do anything to me. Tears sprang to Paul's eyes, his bravado vanished. That's right, said my mother, pulling the hot iron up from its haunches, on its haunches. It didn't do anything to you. That bird did not deserve to die. And then she peered down at the dark spade on my dad's work shirt, as if she had no idea how it got there. Oh, I don't know my word, she muttered, and then quickly looking up, commanded, Paul, go wash your face and the rest of you scram. I have to get ready for work. The next weekend, my other brothers, my two other brothers, and I went to Tin Can Hill to see Paul's kill site. Jennifer would not come. She was listening to the monkeys on the radio and learning how to back them and style her hair. She pursed her lips at me when I asked her to come, made a kissing sound in the air. I didn't know exactly what that meant except no. Paul had been grounded. Are you kidding? I'm never going there again. It's not that great. Tin Can Hill was situated halfway between Con Mine and a construction site. It was a dump site, a collection of garbage from the shack town that sprung up on the shores of Great Slave in the mid thirties. But something in the volume of rusting cans, can upon can upon can, was crude music to my brothers and my ears. So much so, we clambered over the bank of the tip and pawed through the last of the slush and snow to uproot the old cans. The spring snow absorbed the rusty orange residue, and it was beautiful beneath that blue, blue sky. The air was light and smelled like sap letting go. There were willows reaching for the sun and on black spruce, a sticky ooze on the bark. As we scrambled through the winter's leavings, the knees of our snow pants and the palms of our mittens became wet and streaked with rust from the ancient foreign material we were liberating from the snow. Here's one, here's another one. And we flung the tins up in the air, sending bits of moss and lichen spinning airborne. We dug and pawed the surface, unearthing layer upon layer of discarded cans and we threw them aloft, a mad gusto spurred by the shift in season. Let's pretend we're Indians, real Indians who can live off the land, cried Will, rubbing his mitten hand across his face, um, staining his face with streaks of orca and grime. You be the chief, said Ned to my older brother, and he held his own face still as Will rubbed rust into his freckles to make him brown. Now we can kill Tarmagon, I yelled, as I smeared the rust across my own forehead and chin, hungry to feel the transformation I saw in my brothers. Now we can hunt, said Will, and he uprooted Deadfall, a slender branch, and slung it over his head, a whipping stick, a raised firearm. We fell in line, something loosened within us, and my younger brother and I grabbed sticks and marched down Tin Can Hill, blasting a flock of an imaginary Tarmgen as we headed home, marked as original copper people, painted orange, Indians at last, giddy and carefree. That's a small section that is sort of a, a notion that I had of the noble savage, that Indigenous people had this freedom that I didn't have. In this book, I'm trying to um, really, really look at two tropes of Indigenous people. And if, if you will bear with me, I'll do a very small second reading um, that talks about the other trope, which is a much more difficult one to deal with. And I'll just have to set this up briefly. Um, when we first got there, we lived in the uh, 
Gold Ranch Hotel and uh, wasn't a great place for a uh, seven uh, family of seven kids. I met a lot of people in that hotel, in those dim hallways. And one of the people I met was a woman who was uh, longing for her child who wasn't with her, even though I don't know this story, I was very young. But um, in my mind, I thought of her as the caribou queen. So this is looking at dissecting the trope of the caribou queen and my coming to understand what it really is. So this is a little bit harder, this chapter, and I, it's not long. Years after the Gold Range encounter, woman, when I was nine or 10, I saw the caribou queen late one Saturday morning. If it was her, and I can't be sure, she had changed. Both of us had changed. But I had not the insight to recognize my slippage from innocence to experience in eight short years. This woman was a fixture in front of the post office, a brawling battle axe of a woman roaring with anger and drink. I ran into her around the same time. It was said she let go with her empty Molson X bottle and conked Sophie football over the head. Conked, it's a curious word. It's a playful word, sounds impulsive and non-injurious. The phrase cracked across the skull sounds a lot more serious. A woman hits another woman across the head with a beer bottle and I use the word conked. Is it because the woman who was hit didn't really matter to me? She was one of a parade of people, characters they were called, who populated the fringes of our hard rock town. Characters like conk is again a strange choice of words. According to the Oxford Concise, a character is a person interesting and amusing, but somehow not quite fully human. I knew of characters in movies or at least a passing knowledge of characters from television. Fred Flintstone was a character, as was the hapless, hapless coyote of the Bugs Bunny comedy hour fame. Why, the coyote could get massacred a thousand different ways, yet he never seemed to get hurt or feel pain. His was a personality twice removed, once by the screen and the second time by his limited emotions. Yet the characters of my childhood were not animated fantasies, but fully flesh and blood. Perhaps white people, including myself, found it easier and preferential not to perceive Indigenous people wholly. As children, we were always thrilled to see one of these characters ranging around downtown in broad daylight. It was considered a rare and wondrous thing to see Jimmy the Wind or Crazy Tom D in the Newtown at all. But when the woman I knew as a caribou queen occupied the third aisle of Rexall's drugstore, I thought I had hit pay dirt. I was there and she was there, the caribou queen, loud and belly laughing, laughing, opening all the cheerful cartoon cards, rummaging through the comic book, snorting with pleasure. I crouched near the dispensary and watched in horror and awe as scrawny Alice Thompson on her part-time weekend and after-school job suggested in her timid mouse voice that the queen move along. Don't mess your shorts, bellowed the caribou queen, and she gave the rack a final twirly whirl before she marched out, comic books spinning and fluttering like bright butterflies in her way. In that moment, my heart left with love for the caribou queen and for her bravado. She was brave and bold, way bigger than my scrawny life. I picked up my dad's prescription, he had something called Aunt Gina, and followed her outside. <laughs> A few steps away, Charlie Ribb panhandled outside the post office. A gentle, harmless alcoholic, uh, he quickly withdrew his open palm as the caribou queen swept past. She wasn't going to spare him a dime. She might spare him a black eye, but only if he backed off, which he wisely and comically did, mugging and bowing behind her back. Now that took guts. I heard the first caribou queen got her name because she once butchered six caribou in one afternoon on the ice of Back Bay. Six caribou in one go. That was her claim to fame, that and the fact that she ruled street life. She was both feared and admired. Sophie Football, a young woman from Ray Edso, 70 miles kilometer east of Yellowknife, was found dead shortly after my encounter with the queen in the drugstore. Shortly after, they said she conked Sophie with the football. 
I got my information from talking on the from talk on the elementary school playground Monday morning eavesdropping. I heard that two teenagers trapping Martins after church had noticed 12 ravens circling on the Conline Road. That's where they found Sophie deep in a snowbank, a stone's throw from our house. At first, they thought she was sleeping it off. You know, one of the big grade six boys said of the hunters. Then he put his fist to his mouth and tilted back his head, fake guzzling as though she poured her own fate down her throat, as though she got what she deserved. My dad said it was just her face peeking out, said his companion. She was fro froze clean through, froze solid. The following weekend in the in the dimming afternoon after our lunch dishes were put away, I asked Jennifer why Sophie didn't knock on our door. I remember her rolling her eyes. Yeah, right, like dad's gonna let her come into our warm house in the middle of the night? Our dad would let her in. You have to let people in, especially in winter. Yeah, well, she didn't knock, did she? And that was that. I guess Sophie Football chose the wrong night to come to town to go drinking at the Gold Range. Everyone knew not to tangle with the original caribou, caribou queen, but Sophie was out of her own territory. She was fairly young, only 36, and still pretty, a princess in waiting, a threat to the queen's sovereignty. When I imagine the caribou queen's record slaughter on Great Slave Lake, those six caribous, I always picture snow the color of anger, blood, but when Sophie football was hit over the head and then found frozen to death, steps from my warm bedroom, I saw her death as clean and neat and very, very white. Now that I have filled in the lines and colors of my own pencil sketch childhood, I know this isn't so. Sophie's death was dark and violent, and like far too many since, it remains unresolved. She may have been killed by the caribou queen and that rogue beer bottle, or she may have been killed by someone else. Public alcoholism and street violence were normalized, almost condoned in my town in those early days before Yellowknife became a territorial capital. So too were indigenous women with missing children. That and the casual brutality of the terrible word squaw. Yet I was unable to draw a line between what seemed to be the same person, a tender mother aching for a small boy far away, and a woman negating that same pain with alcohol, lashing out at anyone who came into her orbit. For me, Sophie Football was the first victim in what has become a horrific list of murdered and missing Indigenous women, an acronym we say by rote. Sophie's death, no matter how it came about, is heartbreaking. At a very young age, I recognized that the closed door of our family home played its own terrible part. Our closed door, all our closed doors. Half a century later, I recognize how little has changed. Thank you. Now we get to do the comments. Now I get to ask you a big question. <laughs> How to turn on the mic? There we go. <laughs> Margaret. That, that was that was some reading you just gave. I loved it. Thank you. I I noticed something that, that when you're um, you're writing descriptive scenes, it's it sounds maybe a bit more like a memoir. But when you're doing dialogue and when characters are tugging against each other. And it gets dramatic. Felt like the hand of the novelist. Ah, uh, yes. Is is there anything you can tell me about that combination of of two two literary impulses, the memoir and the novel? Yes, I, I hope I can tell you something. It um, I I have never written a memoir. I've never written a memoir. I learned to write a memoir by writing a memoir. Uh, it's probably not the best way to do it. Um because this work started out as a novel. 
And then I had to recognize, that's why it took a long time, the notion I cannot speak for another culture. I cannot speak in the voice of Sophie or the Carib Queen or Lawrence or any of my characters. And so I took out everything that I invented, everything that was invented. And I kept the scenes that were true of my own life and my own childhood. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, like all books, you know, it goes through many incarnations and much, much um, re revision. But I felt that I could activate the scenes as long as there was reflection upon the scenes. So that's probably why it reads novelistically. It reads, is that a word, novelistically? I it don't should know. be. Let's yeah. say, yeah. say from now on it is. <laughs> um, and it's, but it's, um, it, it's sort of the idea of scene, summary, and reflection was the model I was going on. So reflection of the 62-year, really late blooming, uh, like quite late in my day to recognize my own privilege. I have to say a lot of people are earlier than that, but um, so, so I kept some of those scenes, but I really filtered it through an unreliable narrator and a young, young person, a young person, because I took on the attitudes of the time. I took them all on. It was, um, yeah, it was all I knew. And I just took them on. Sorry, I've got a, sorry, I've got a tissue here. <laughs> um, excuse me. That's not really answering your question. Yeah, it reads novelistically because I kept the scene somewhat intact from the initial iteration. Yeah. Yeah. So is it really a memoir? I mean, it was the publisher who said, this is a memoir. You have to call this a memoir and you have to use the word settler. So people would know I was white. And white, a writing, a white woman writing about colonization and indigeneity is a bit of a risky thing. But I think people need to, need to kind of find a, a way forward. And I think it starts by examining their own lives. So I thought the best way to do it was to take a damn hard look at my own life and see all those miss those miss steps that I made as a child and influenced by the world around me. But I'm not a child anymore, and I can own those things. And it is the beginning, I believe, to becoming truly what I think we all want is to be an ally to you know, the people who we've, we've, we've uh, benefited, we've benefited on the backs of, of others. And it's time to maybe take a look at that. But you should ask me questions. I shouldn't go on and on. No, but you're, I like it when you go on. <laughs> but um, while we're on this subject, um, I, 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 I think it, the idea is not to write a book that will aspire to the definition of a memoir. It's to write a damn good book and not worry whether it's a part memoir, part novel, or or what. Don't you think? Yeah, but it's not it's not a novel. It's not it's mm -hmm. not a novel. It's written with the same and I don't think they're that far apart to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It's written with the same eye to um emotive language to setting to character to that sort of thing. It's these these the nut of these characters are are these characters. These people are real people. Um, I've just played a little bit with. Um, I've played a little bit with them to serve the story. Like I was telling somebody, you know, my life was full and rich and yelling. I've had a wonderful life. I pulled about eight percent of it for this book. I chose about eight percent. The scenes that I felt really illuminated. Um, white privilege and really illuminated the racism that I came up with. Um, and that's what I think it's, it's reaching back into your past and figuring out which one, what, if I want to tell a big truth, then what scenes of my own life serve that truth? And that's what I was attempting. It, it's a, it's a, 
balancing like it's a it's a shuffle right it's a but I really really tried to be honest without um like pointing fingers or I want the audience whoever reads this book I want them to not look at my life my life isn't very interesting really but I want them to ruminate on their own lives and their own part mm -hmm. in this and I identified with that kid uh, who had taken on the uh, ideologies of the time, taken on yeah. the attitudes yeah. of the time. I identified with her. In fact, I remember now how so many of us wanted to play the Indian role in the games we played. We wanted to be oh, yeah. Indians in, yeah. in a sense. Indians without really knowing, like, because I believe that stereotype of the noble savage, which I got certainly caught up in my 12, 13, 14 adolescence, that became that's a, just a different type of stereotype you know it's just it's yeah. not you know the drunk indian the noble sounds equally damning these, these are not real like we're not we're pretend like we're sort of projecting some image that isn't true yeah I, i'm reminded of carl maya you know the german novelist who uh wrote about colors and indians um, very successfully. Oh, in the uh, 18, in the nineteen early nineteen. Yeah, without yeah. first going to North America and knowing anything about it. Yeah, that's that's. You see, I think it's a projection of that same attitude. Very very hard stereotype to break. In fact, my publisher, if I can boast a little bit, he took this book to Frankfurt, like he just got home yesterday, and he's trying to uh, dispel that German mythology by selling them this book, the rights to this book. I have no idea if he was successful. I'm holding my breath, but um, it, it's, he said it's really hard because people prefer stereotypes. People prefer stereotypes. They're easier to deal with when you're dealing with real people. And this book um, defines my life and in, to some degree, the life of my family um, from the age of three to the age of 17. And I left Yellowknife at 17. Um, so it's a real adolescent childhood story. Um, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Those animals that came to you, those big animals? Yeah. Did they, did you think they might have come and appeared to you for something as a gift to you, like for some reason? Well, in one sense, I, I think of them, well, especially the cougars, but the grizzlies and the wolves. Um, that I got to see, and in some cases, do a bit of engaging with. Uh, I think of them as gifts. I, yeah. I, I don't know if they were intended as gifts, but uh, I feel just so lucky to have seen yeah. so many amazing animals. Yeah. Dave Carpenter and I just met today. <laughs> we don't really know each other, but I had the privilege of reading his book um, prior, most of it. I was kind of busy trying to arrange four book launches from 4,000 miles away. Don't tell me about it. <laughs> so I'm being a little bit kind of greedy with this book. This is my first opportunity to talk about it. And I asked, asked the publisher, they said, we'll give you a book launch. And I said, can I have four? Like, because I had to fly all the way from Ontario. And, you know, I, and I just asked for more because I want so much for this work. You know, like I've, I've given up on, we have to give up on the whole idea of fame and money, right? Yeah, I think I dropped that one a while ago. But we can't give up on, on social change. We can't give up on really, really taking some time to look at, even if we, like, we don't think we're privileged, we'll take a look and see how you got to where you are. And all this book is, I think, is just a mirror to for other people. It's just a mirror, and um, I I don't know if people will agree or not, and it doesn't matter to me. But that's what I wrote. That's why I wrote it, and I'm forcefully going to <laughs> my poor husband Mark, who's been like so great and accompanied me out west, and it's just that you know you can. 
you can only talk about something for so long and then it's like okay can we talk about something else <laughs> besides the care about Wayne <laughs> but you know in the book writing business you have a really small little window where you can um you can make a a small little um splash and um I'm going for it I'm Bet. I'm going for it Bet. yeah Bet. Um, this might be your last chance in a long time to interrogate Margaret about her book and her her life. So, uh, if you want to ask us any questions uh, or challenges from the floor, I'm, we're very open. I, I guess could we go there and there? Sure. So I was just wondering, like I know it's difficult to raise um, when you're involving the indigenous population and. There's a lot of fear involved, especially as, like you said, the settlers, um, I call them Pakiha, but Pakiha is the, the Maori way of saying a white person, because I spent quite a bit of time in New Zealand. But anyways, it's 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 intimidating. And where I was always taught that we're supposed to get the permission from the elder, or did that ever, like, did you ever feel like you needed to get the blessings or permission from an elder or... or I, I appreciate that question very much. And um, we, we being New West Press, my publisher and I um, were very, very careful. I had, when this was in manuscript form, I hired people, uh, Indigenous people to read it. When the book was going to go to press, uh, New West Press hired an Indigenous author to look at it. When those graves were discovered in Cam Camel Camloops, thank you, the press freaked out and said, we can't publish this book. It's about residential schools. Like, the Indigenous editor said, no, you must publish this book. It was the Indigenous editor, Rhonda Brown, who stood up. She's Dene. And she stood up and she said, no, no. Like, you must publish this book. Yes, of course there's fear. Like, I... I could be wholly condemned, but I we were careful. We we had indigenous with, uh, people look at it. We had sensitivity readers. We we really really tried our best to be as respectful as possible to keep it in a point of view. There's there's a lot of con condemnation in this book, but it isn't for the indigenous people. It's mostly for the colonist people which is mostly for me, cheeky little me, who just thought, no, yeah, this is my do. You know, I would walk through the Hudson's Bay to get warm and nobody thought Marvie McPherson was gonna pocket a lipstick, but any one of my indigenous friends, they were tagged, they were tailed. Guess who was stealing? <laughs> Not a, no, just once, but. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. I'm curious about when you said that the publisher said you needed to use the word settler. What word would you have used in, in instead of settler? They wanted to. The question is, why did I have to use the word settler? And the publisher. Um, no, is, no, no, no. But what before that was said to you, what were you going to call the settlers or the white people in the book? It's yeah. Hard. Uh, what word would you have used? Um, we were talking about um, tracking the caribou queen, semicolon, um, movement towards colonial culpability. That was the title, a movement or notes towards colonial culpability or something like that. But nobody really wants to come to a book <laughs> that's going to be about how yeah. terrible they are. <laughs> So they so when they said, well, what about memoir of a settler girl, girlhood? I I really fought hard for girlhood because I think the different um, I had a different experience than my three brothers. I think my sister and I had a very different experience than my three brothers, just because we were female. Um, girlhood was important to me. Settler was it's not. A, I mean, I do now, of course, see myself as a settler, but it's a hard word to, you know, to start 
saying, yeah, I, this was not, you know, the whole, like, let's not go into the Catholic church and the doctrine of discovery and all that stuff, but yeah, it's, so what word were they going to use instead of settler? I mean, they didn't come up with another word, but it's just, they needed the reading public, you, the reading public to know that this is a white woman writing. And it's really important that, you know, I am a white woman writing. I am not, I read so many trauma narratives that were so effective and beautiful and crushing that I needed to respond to that. And the only thing I can do is write. That's the only thing I'm good at. So I wrote in some ways as a response to these trauma narratives because we have to respond. We can't just say, oh, you've been hurt. Gosh. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm going. Mm -hmm. I appreciate very, very much. I appreciate very much that we've written this book. Mm -hmm. I think it's about time we can start. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I mean, the best thing you guys could do is tell your friends, buy a copy, buy a copy for a friend, write a review on Goodreads. I don't know. It's like a big game, the marketing thing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you have to get the word out. And I, I'm i not great at it. Like, I don't even know how to work my phone. So, <laughs> so. I think so, you're very brave, only your phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess it's really just, thank you for saying that. I don't feel brave. I don't know the re response of the Indigenous community. I had one review in the uh, Winnipeg Free Press. That was very positive, very positive, and I was very pleased to get the review. Um, but I've also had publishers saying to me, nobody's going to even read this book because you are white. And I, like you just write it and you just put it out of the world. This feels like a great big bird to me. Yeah. And then the child goes out into the world and whatever happens, it's like, yikes. Be careful on the 401. Like, you know. <laughs> Right, Dave? Absolutely. <laughs> you might get chawed off by a crocodile or something. Yeah, yeah. yes. I'm glad I bought this uh, this book after my parents passed away uh, because uh, had I had I written it before, they would know I was I was you know gunning for it, going for an early death. <laughs> Boys are half in love with death anyway. Well, that's one of my brothers who are always pretending fighting or shooting and yeah. anyway i'm i'm very yes um thank you for your work and i wonder if you could say a little bit more about navigating the, you know, the third parties your brother and sister uh, you know that back to the thing you had right um, I come from it from an academic perspective that you always have to have everything signed off. Right. Yeah. I um I gave this book to my three. I lost we lost our sister. Um gosh, eight years ago now. But my three remaining brothers, I gave them carte blanche permission to uh take the book, the manuscript. And I said, This is my impression. This is this is my impression, my as you say, almost novelistic impressions serving the story of my childhood, but it involves you. And if either any of you three don't want this book to go, I'm okay with that. And I asked them individually. Rod said, man, I was just a guy who bought a coat that was too big. And my other brother said, it's kind of boring. You should have a murder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's, they, we haven't done anything legal, like, but they still like me. Like, I think Rod invited most of you people. <laughs> like, like, I think I'm so lucky. I, I, I feel very, very lucky that I have a real love and trust in my siblings, and we have such a family. I did really struggle with the that, of the sense that maybe I was betraying my father. He's a different generation. And I did struggle with that because he was so beloved and he was such a, you know, he was CCF, he was Tommy Douglas, he was Saskatchewan born, yay. And just, just a fine human being, like just a fine human being. But he was a product of his time. He went up there to educate. They created this hostel for the residential 
yeah. component of his school where all the indigenous kids live. And they all lived there. We all went to school and this ideal of a third in a third Dene and a third towny white people. And we'd all live in happy harmony. Did it work? I mean, I have some impressions here, but I'll tell you the impressions of did it work are all over the map. These are simply my impressions of did it work. Did I answer your question? Well, it's, it's, it's you have a family. How it is. Yeah. <laughs> because colon colonialism really isn't just this, the people in this room, it's Canada. Mm -hmm. Like, my biggest dream is to get this book across the Manitoba border. And have people interested in the East, where my husband and I live in Ontario now. I need to I need to work hard and try to like it's a little more recent history in the Northwest Territories. Like in my lifetime, this is my memory, and out here in Alberta and Saskatchewan and, and Manitoba even, but in Ontario, and it's so much more. It's so the history is so much longer. And I don't know if people see as much there. Anyway, I mean, that's a big question. Any, it doesn't. Where are you at the book launches? Oh, I get to go to Edmonton. And here's something really exciting. I invited uh, two Indigenous poets to read whatever they want carte blanche. Who's reading with me? I'm having Daniel Potras. Um, and I'm having Naomi McElwraith, and I'm having Lana Whiskey Jack is singing. She's doing an honor song and a book blessing. Um, so Lana Whiskey Jack's going to do that. And then I'm having a, the, Dene, the Dene editor, Rhonda. She's, she's going to do the interview with me. So I'm putting all the, I'm trying to put all the power into the hands of, you know, so it's not just, so I'm doing Edmonton. That's the biggie for me, the biggie. That's where my people are. And then I'm going to uh, Nelson because um, I have a brother there and I'll have to see if he kills me. <laughs> I don't think he will. He's, he's really excited for me too. And then I'm going to Calgary. Uh, so Saskatoon, Edmonton, Nelson, just because I have a place to stay and then um, uh, Calgary. And then and then if the, if the book does well, then I might try to um, see if I can uh, make a make a grant application or something and and try to you know you know ugh. I wondered if you were going to Ontario uh, I yes in my little hometown of Deep River which I've only been in a year and a half I asked the library if I could have a launch and I invited another local author so some people are there it's a very small town but they're very very lovely and warm people and so I'm going to have a little uh launch in my town of Deep River which is very small mm -hmm. but you know maybe 20 people might come and maybe they'll tell 20 more and you know it's exponential it's it's mm -hmm. and so yeah I don't know what will happen we never know do we no I think in this profession um you have to be half in love with utility um, <laughs> oh futility but just half in love with utility <laughs> because there's so many things that can go wrong right from the day you start writing to the day you Start publicizing it. And, and you have to not like, you have to not strive for success and you have to not strive for fame and you have to not strive for money. You have to strive. It's like a vocation. Mm -hmm. I it think is. of it as like a vocation. That's a better word. Yes. It's a vocation. It's not a profession. It's a vocation. You have something you want to explore and you want to explore in language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that as a person who was looking very hard to learn what we need to learn to get himself, being patient with himself, reading lots of um, lots of um, things by people, but what you think is and a lot of what you're saying is my story is about the child. 
It's a book that is actually written. Thank you for saying that. It's really, and the comment was simply for those who can't hear, the comment was simply that this resonates with white people. And to be fair, it's written. I mean, the you know, the indigenous population is five percent and the white population or you know, it's it's written for white people to really take a long, cold, hard look at their hearts. And I don't have any answers. Like I do not tell you what to think or anything. Like I don't. I don't present answers. I can't. I have no answers. I present my story. Well, my well, thank you, and thank you for even considering buying the book. It's kind of expensive. <laughs> You had to say that. <laughs> they're, they're, they're kind of expensive now, but yeah. As a book lover, I'm not saying that that's true. Okay. This well, one is more expensive. Than books, no, right? they're normal, but it's like every time somebody buys a book, it's like books can books can change the world. It's like change can change hearts, can change attitudes. Books are really important. And um, you know, I think we were blessed, my brothers and I, to grow up in a place that had no TV until 1972. No TV. So we just had a different, no TV. Like, people can't even imagine that now. Yeah. It was really wonderful. <laughs> so we, uh, all right. If there are no more questions, um, you can join me in thanking Margaret and David for being here tonight. And thank you all for joining us as well. Um, Margaret, I believe we'll stick around to sign some books. We've got a table set up over there for her to do so. Um, we've got copies of Practically Caribou Queen and a couple of other titles as well, just on that table there. And you're welcome to get your copy signed before you purchase it. Just make sure to stop the cash desk on your way out. Thank you all so much for being here. You know what else?